Hi, and welcome to Happy Hour, Happy Patients. We are a healthcare innovation podcast that highlights ideas, trends, and innovations happening all around us in the healthcare system. I'm your host, Lisa Blue. Today, we are lucky to have Susan Kortz joining us. She is a pioneer in the healthcare market, and her list of accomplishments is quite impressive. One of the most exciting things about Susan is her drive and desire to serve populations that are often underserved. I'm excited to share her insights with all of you today through our conversation. Our show title, Happy Hour, Happy Patients, represents references the concept that focusing on our own health and happiness has a direct positive impact on the patients we serve. We created this space to talk with our extraordinary guest and hopefully these conversations inspire and re-energize you while sharing the exciting how-tos that you could take with you to make your next workday and patient interaction a little bit better. We all know that change happens incrementally, so sharing these ideas can move us all towards improvement together. Now let me introduce today's guest. Susan provides the leadership and vision behind her company, Catalytic Health Partners, to pursue its mission of reshaping healthcare. Catalytic Catalytic Health Partners focuses on helping individuals who otherwise may be underserved by more traditional care delivery. She is a serial entrepreneur and business executive recognized for leading passion-driven, high-performance organizations that consciously make an indelible positive impact at at every level for all stakeholders. Susan has been a CEO and founder of multiple companies over the past two decades, which have created new ways to provide solutions in healthcare through predictive analytics and proprietary technologies. Personally and professionally, she has a deep commitment to her community, which entails volunteering, organizing, and sponsoring community impact programs, one of which I've had the opportunity to participate in at every holiday season, and it's truly one of my favorite activities of the year. Susan has also been recognized for her work um, through a number of really impressive awards, including the Athena Award for Fostering Collaboration. In 2019, she received three different awards, Arizona Health Leader of the Year, another for Outstanding Women in Business from the Phoenix Business Journal, um, as well as uh, a national recognition for a woman of inspiration. In 2022, she was also recognized as the Titan 100. So certainly a very impressive uh, background, Susan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Lisa. I'm very excited to be able to be here with you today and to share what insights I may have and uh, help to continue to grow our community. Susan, I, I want to start today's conversation uh, on a, a rather big topic. And, and while we're not going to solve all the world's problems in one conversation, especially in healthcare, I would love to hear from your perspective and that of the work that you and your team are doing every day, that what do you feel is the biggest opportunity within the healthcare system today? Well, that is a big question, uh, Lisa. But I would say, you know, the biggest opportunity we have in healthcare today is to to focus really on the people we are serving. So what are the people in front of us need and to be present in that time and to spend that time present with them? Um, I feel like healthcare has gone to a bunch of rapid transactions that often are trying to meet boxes or meet requirements rather than listening and hearing the person in front of us and trying to discern what they truly need and how we can meet that need. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, certainly both of us having come in from clinical experiences ourselves can uh, can relate to that idea that, you know, often those um, at many exchanges can feel transactional. And so, Bringing that focus back uh, certainly is is a, a big opportunity for uh, for not only our patients but for us, right? For those of us that went into this work because we felt driven to work with and, and serve our patients. So I'm interested in you know a little bit about the journey. What what prompted you to to start? Catalytic Health Partners. You know, I, I know you've had success in other endeavors. And so I would like you to take us just a little bit on a journey. And, you know, what what steps made you say, this is something I really um, want to do? And, and what were some of the, the challenges that you felt like moving in this direction would address in healthcare? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, Lisa. I think um, an exciting one, right? 
So I actually had worked at the same hospital for 20 years uh, when I left there uh, as an executive thinking, gosh, we kind of lost our way in healthcare. It was all about focusing on how much money we could make versus what was really great for the person we were trying to serve. So I left healthcare thinking I'd go off and do something else and be an entrepreneur, goodness knows, do something uh, and do other things. And I was probably one of the few people that when the Affordable Care Act came along, I was really excited as a healthcare professional to say, you know, we're actually going to be held accountable for outcomes and for making a difference in people's lives. I won't say the Affordable Care Act actually has lived up to that in its holistic uh, thought process, but at least we began some steps, I felt like, in the right direction of saying, you know what, it is about the people we're trying to serve, and can we help them to get better, and for us to focus and dedicate ourselves to that. So, you know, I had a, a transitional care company and uh, began a little bit of that journey, but then realized that I had a bigger opportunity if I could do something along the lines that we do at Catalytic, where, you know, we take risk on our population. So we are a full risk value-based contracting organization that, you know, essentially says we believe in ourselves, right? And we believe in others in the system. Um, so we'll be at risk for those outcomes. We will help individuals who uh, really are high risk and high need to have improved lives. And we really focus on that from a perspective of meeting social needs. So those very basic needs of do I have enough food to eat? Do I have clothes on my back? Uh, do I feel safe and secure? All the way through helping their mental and uh, physical health. So I find this to be exciting and what I think is really focusing on a, the whole human. Uh, so uh, I've loved it, doing this. It's kind of my dream come true. I really love that description, the that that very holistic approach, right? Uh, as you just said, for the whole person. And, and I think in healthcare, even sometimes when we talk about that, the, there, there's still challenges. You know, we, we both have worked, uh, within the community and, and serve some of the same population. So I think we're both very familiar with some of the, you know, what, what do social determinants of health look like and, and how, how do they impact our patients? And so I'm wondering if you could, um, you know, give us maybe just some insight into, you know, what does that look like? Is that part of the, the onboarding when you are working with a, a new uh, a patient or member? How do you continue to incorporate that in, in their ongoing care? How long do patients or members stay with you? We'd love to hear more about what that looks like. Absolutely. So I think it's worth uh, stating that we take care of people across the entire spectrum of healthcare. So from seriously mentally ill to chronic co-occurring uh, physical health conditions, whatever that might be. And we do all of our work in their home. So we're not home health. We're more like a house call provider group, I'd say, an integrated house call provider group who um, shows up and from the intake, if you wish to think of it that way, depending upon your perspective. So our initial engagement with the member, social determinants of health are part of that conversation. Um, we likewise have that as part of our conversation every single time we engage with members. And there is an interesting component that when you bring it up first and you ask questions and focus on it, you get people to be more comfortable in sharing those things of, you know, I actually don't have enough food to eat. Um, and so you can meet that need, you can help. Uh, coming at it from the perspective that I'm going to do something about it. So you're not gonna just tell me something and I go, oh, well, that's terrible. But rather to go, you know what, I, I hear you and we can do something about that. So let's figure out what do we need to do. Um, that makes that dialogue easier and makes it um, possible and comfortable, I guess I would say, to be part of the dialogue every time you engage with someone. And I think it also helps people realize that without those very basic things being met, that we know that it's hard for them to move on in life. And, you know, I, I really believe in Maslow's hierarchy. I think, you know, when our basic needs aren't met, we don't have that good solid foundation there for us to stand on that we actually can't get to health because health is actually the top of the pyramid, the self-actualization. So we don't expect we're going to just, you know, bounce up there and, and stay there on the top of the pyramid without a you know good foundation underneath us. 
You know, I think you said a couple of things that really stand out to me there. You know, one is the idea of prioritizing that conversation from the outset, right? That is as important or more important to address, identify, and, and really address those, those needs. Um, and I think giving the, the person who is now feeling comfortable enough to share them the, the safety and security to share those, right? To, to the permission even to prioritize that that's just as important as, as some of the other things that we're going to talk about today, maybe a chronic condition, uh, a chronic medical condition as well. So I, I think that is, is really, is really, uh, remarkable. And, you know, your, your point about, um, you know, one, keeping it as part of the conversation because you've already prioritized it. You've already said this is important to us and we recognize it's important to you. I think that's a really great strategy. You know, the other is really uh, realizing as human beings that we, we can't expect someone to jump to the top of that pyramid. And so I think foundationally, you have set up your, your team and, and the patients that they serve uh, well by, by making that part of the, the fundamental understanding that if, if we want to help somebody reach here, we, we have to put some, uh, some structure beneath that. So I, I think that's, that's really, um, th those, those definitely stood out for me. So thank you for sharing that. So I would like to just pause a little bit. You've had such an exciting career and uh, I think that's one of the best things about uh, healthcare and, and nursing specifically, all of the different areas that, that we can go and not just in our own personal development, but the things that we can take from one area of our clinical experience and then apply them in another area as, as you've done multiple times in, in your different entrepreneurial ventures. So as someone that has had such success in your career, I'd love for you to share some of the challenges or lessons learned along the way. You know, uh, many people that are starting off in their careers, that can be very intimidating, or even someone who's excited and has an idea that they want to start a company. What are some challenges or lessons learned that you can impart on them that uh, maybe save them some times in their respective journey? Yeah, I love that question. I think um, one of the things that I would say first and foremost is learning to be very vulnerable. I think a lot of times uh, we believe that other people have been so much more successful than we are and they you know, somehow have some magic. When the reality is there's no magic, um, it's really being able to tell people, this is what I need. I don't know that. I actually have no idea. Um, you know, so I can't get help if I already act like I know, if I've already got a problem solved. Who can help me? I mean, you already know it all. Versus say, I have no idea, actually. Or, you know, I'm really needing help with that. Uh, in trying to put yourself out there as a person who's always trying to learn and not the person who needs to be the smartest person in the room who's already figured the world out. Um, and, you know, it took me a while to, to realize that uh, you could be successful without telling people that you already had it figured out because a lot of people do show up that way and give you that idea. And I always considered I had no idea other than I was willing to work hard enough to try to figure it out. And then also realize for myself that those individuals who were telling me they already had it figured out probably didn't have it any more figured out than I did. So I didn't need to actually feel so stupid or feel like I didn't know. It was okay. Uh, so I think that's the first thing I would tell, you know, people is don't worry about it. Again, nobody can help you solve something you're not willing to share that you need solved and everybody else is faking it. So you don't need to fake it. You might as well just be open and be you know, true to who you are. So I think that's one thing I would say. I think the other thing is, you know, really go out and find people who are positive and supportive of you, not patting you on the back and telling you you're awesome and, you know, everything you do is great. That's not it. People are willing to support and say, you know, you might want to think about it this way. Or you said that, and boy, that, that made me wonder. They go, oh, let me listen and hear. Because you, everybody needs somebody to help us to get to the next level. So we should surround ourselves with people who are going to helpfully challenge us and yet be there supporting, working alongside us, pushing us along our journey to be successful. Yeah, very, very well said. I think those are really powerful knowings that if, if 
you know, those of you that are listening can hear that and can receive that. I remember as you were talking about, you know, there's no magic, you know, when you're starting out in a career, you do feel like somehow magically someone has figured this out and they haven't muddled through some of those steps that, you know, especially when you're currently meddling through them. And I remember still being in a clinical role and um, the chief nursing officer of the hospital. I remember looking at her through that lens of that she must somehow just be magical, right? Like how, how did she figure that out? She just knew so much stuff. And, and I did, I, I thought I was just sort of um, enamored by that. And then, you know, through my career, I've tried to share some of the others like, well, I, I don't know the answer to that either, but let's figure that out. So let's, you know, let's, let's get through this together. So, and, and certainly you can't underestimate the power of a, a, a real supportive network, um, you know, be it personally, professionally, or ideally all of the above. Um, and to your point, someone who is willing to say, did you think about it this way? Or even to give tough feedback at times, right? That's just as important as the 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 great parts too. It's all great parts, actually. It's maybe what I want to say. Well, I think you said something there, Lisa, that shouldn't be discounted, right? I mean, the willingness as a leader uh, to to tell people, I don't know, right? And that I'm willing to learn this with you. Uh, because that's what allows other people to grow and decide to maybe follow an entrepreneurial journey or to have the, the empowerment within them to see another opportunity. And we all owe that to other people in, in our lives uh, to share that. So, you know, I applaud you for uh, recognizing that and sharing that with others that you've uh, had work to work with you. Well, thank you. So, Let's shift back to now, now back to present day, not so much the journey. Um, you know, we, we already talked about some of the aspects of what is the, the purpose of the work that you and your team um, at Catalytic Health Partners are, are currently involved in. And um, maybe if you could just tell us a little bit about, you know, what does that look like? Not only today, but where are you guys heading? Tell us about what you hope to see in, in the future, whatever time frame that future is. Yeah, I think that's uh, another great question, right? So I would say, you know, as a team, we work every day uh, looking at what I call our core work and saying, and who else does that serve well? So we know that, you know, we're really do a great job for individuals who are very high risk. Uh, we are not such a great, you know, we're not a, a great house call provider group for people who are doing well. That's not us. Um, so we, we understand that. So how do we continue to grow to helping some of the developmentally disabled populations? Um, we're working right now to see if we can apply our programming to a transitional age youth program. Uh, again, understanding the intensity of care that might be needed and that is provided by our team and aligns with our team. An intensive in-home therapy program, which again, helping individuals to make that acclimation to live within their ecosystem at home with intensive support, such as our teams provide. Uh, looking at other ways that we serve our community well and are able to collaborate and work alongside other providers, other health plans uh, in the community to ensure that those services are available. Uh, well, someday, we hope uh, to be able to move into other states. So we'll see. We continue to work on that. Um, you know, our work is really focused on being a great partner to the members we serve, to the health plans we work with, and to other providers in the community. We're not here to replace or threaten anybody else. We're here to work alongside them. And I know earlier you'd ask, like, how long is your program? Well, typically, members are with us about a year. And our whole goal from that one year of work is to help them to acclimate into being able to be well served by community based providers. So how do we help them to develop some of those skills to get some of those foundational needs met so that they can start thriving and doing amazingly in the community with the traditional supports that are there. I mean, some of our members are on our services longer, It just kind of depends upon the specific program the plan that we're working with and what the needs might be. So it's, a, it's really exciting to see what may be in front of us, right? Absolutely. And so you, I was just going to ask a question, but I think you've just answered it. So primarily you partner with 
uh, payer organizations. Is that correct? That's true. Okay. So we really work with health plans typically, you know, on individuals that they've identified that need a really uh, intensive additional support to be successful. Okay. And um, you also tell us maybe a little bit about what does that collaboration look like from between your team and, and other members of the healthcare community. And I'm saying that loosely because as we just talked about earlier, a lot of the basic care needs might not be defined as healthcare, but so give us an example of what does that collaboration look like? Sure. So um, again, we we want to work with, I'd say we're like Switzerland, right? We want to work with everybody. Uh, we work with nonprofits to meet some of the social needs. Um, we have sometimes funding inside of CHP that will allow us to do some of that as well. Uh, we certainly have fundraisers and other things that we do to support some of those nonprofits that we're able to work with. So that's always exciting. Uh, but when we work with the community-based providers, again, we're not here trying to take over. You know, we're seeing individuals in their home. I always like to think that we're the eyes and ears of those providers to see what's actually going on in the home and be able to share those insights back, whether that's a phone call to their medical assistant to talk to the provider themselves and a provider-to-provider -provider conversation, um, sending records, whatever that might be, to be able to share what we know and how we can all best collaborate and work together to support and help the member. Uh, we work very closely with the health plans. So we have a minimum of monthly meetings with the health plans, each and every one of them. Um, again, it's a very collaborative conversation working through, you know, difficult situations that we're needing extra help with, sharing the amazing successes that many of our members have and uh, their stories of how they've been able to move forward. But likewise, how can we combine resources and really come together as an integrated community to solve problems that otherwise might not ever be exposed, to be honest? Um, and, you know, I, I really feel like everybody doing this work is truly wants to make a big difference for the people we are serving. And so this just gives us all kind of the context in which to do it and the opportunity to do it together. And we're willing to do the heavy lifting. So, you know, if it's like, well, we came up with this idea. OK, well, we're willing to go out and be the ones to execute that idea uh, with all of us, you know, kind of supporting together to, to fill in gaps as we need to. I think that's a really exciting thing about the idea of entrepreneurship, right? You can identify the need and address it. And, and sometimes, oftentimes with, you know, complex patient populations that takes a degree of creativity and doing it different and um, the ability to not only uh, identify what the need is, but to come up with a creative solution and be willing to execute and, and follow up on that and, and take that ownership. I, I think that's I think that's really exciting and, and probably what fuels most of uh, the people on your team to to get yeah, to true. do that work. Right. That's that's wonderful. Absolutely. I think the your comment about um, the the eyes and ears you know really can't be overstated. It's it's really so important. You know when you think of the traditional as we talked about as I introduced you that traditional model of care. Well, there's value to having that uh, relationship with the provider that they see in office. It's a very small amount of time in a patient's overall life and a person's overall life, right? Not just patient. Um, but you know, how do you, how do you extend that out? How do you think, uh, how do they uh, interact with the world around them and, and how uh, can you make that safer and, and healthier for them? So I think there's, there's a lot of power in that, um, you know, as well as that collaboration that you described. So that's wonderful as well as I really like the, that model, the, the approach that you described with sustainability that, that, you know, you, you really tried to come, um, plan to set them up with those skills and, and work towards those goals together. Um, so they can be safe and healthy and as safe and healthy as they can be in their current setting. I think that's really, really remarkable. And, um, you know, while while that might seem simple, it's it's certainly not. Um, so I, I certainly applaud you guys for for doing that work, not just in the acute phase, but really helping people continue to work towards their goals, whatever their goals might be. 
Absolutely. It, it is an easy work. It, I always tell people what we do is not rocket science, but it, it takes a lot of dedication, right? So no doubt about it. It's it's one thing to say something. It's another thing to execute the same thing. So absolutely. So I know that you in, in this work, as well as some of the other work you've done before, you have done a lot of work using technology and, uh, and the, the cross section of technology and healthcare. And, and certainly I would say that you, you were a pioneer and that you were doing that a, a lot before that was sort of more common in the healthcare setting as, as it is today. So I would be interested to hear from you because you have were, you know, such a, uh, an, an early adopter and a visionary in that space. What things, what do you think are some of the most promising things in healthcare IT that are happening today or up and coming that people should be aware of? Well, I mean, I definitely feel like um, there are positive aspects that could be had from artificial intelligence. Um, you know, I, I ran an uh, artificial intelligence company for many years. And so I feel like there is a lot of benefit that can come from that when used appropriately, right? Certainly, uh, there's some inappropriate uses of everything. So, you know, focused appropriately, I feel like artificial intelligence will really uh, help healthcare. I've always felt like there was a huge opportunity in healthcare to support providers, no matter how experienced, no matter how smart you are or how remote and uh, distanced you are from, you know, maybe the mainstream to be able to leverage all the information we have, all the data we've collected on the individuals we are serving, and to say, hey, when you look across everything, there is a big database of um, options to look against and say, this might be what's actually wrong with this person. Um, and promote, I'll say, thorough diagnosing, uh, irrespective of where you're at. So I think that's pretty exciting, a pretty exciting opportunity. I also feel like in technology, we have evolved to a place where we could integrate a number of data sets to really support, um, again, that more integrated, holistic view of humans and how we can best meet their needs. Uh, where we've typically leveraged that data in silos, which really limits our insights and capabilities, I think uh, we definitely have the capability to do that on a broader scope. Uh, certainly, there are HIPAA limitations and other things that might cause us to need to think through those and to think through the risks. Uh, but the potential is there, and I think there is some potential to do some great things to make a big difference um, in that space. So I think that's really important. Uh, I think, honestly, we don't even leverage simple technologies well sometimes. And... I always find that baffling, right? It's like, I, in fact, I was just having a phone, uh, conversation with somebody the other day. I said, you know, um, if we just use the phone a little more often, I think we might be ahead of the game. <laughs> and they're like, what do you mean by that? And I was like, well, we're quick to send somebody a text or an email about what we want. But if we just picked up a phone and called them, we might have the problem solved. And it is interesting to see that uh, sometimes. And then I think on the converse side, right? Oh, I'm going to try to call all the members. I'm going to try to do this and that and to say, well, okay, but how many times have you tried that phone call? Lots. Okay, well, did you send them a text message? Did you, you know, do something that might be a different channel? No, this is the only way we do it. So I do think sometimes we get a little stuck and it can only be one way when the reality is, we have a breadth of things that we could already do if we thought about our processes from the outside and thought about the people we're trying to engage with and then go, how would they like to receive something from us? And realizing that I'll say a multi-channeled approach doesn't have to be hard. We have tons of technology out there that supports that today. And that technology doesn't have to be horribly expensive for you to accomplish that. So I think it is interesting sometimes to see how, in spite of all we have in front of us, how little we use. Mm -hmm. I think you know your your point of it's it's easy for people to get stuck, right? This is this is the way, right? I'm going to work through this list and you know, sort of check it off, and I've left messages, and you know, there with all things, there's a middle ground, right? And so, what works for one might not work for others, and so you know, using technology in a way to you know 
create some efficiencies, but also recognizing that there may be times that I'm going to stop and I'm going to have this conversation, this deeper conversation with a patient. Uh, you know, it's one of the things that we often say in our work that this is not ever, technology is not ever intended to replace the human interaction. Um, quite the contrary, but if, if, uh, you know, a lion's share of patients in a particular group maybe just needed a reminder and needed a little bit more guidance in what to do next, but there's a small segment of patients that do need a lot additional support and, and questions answered. Now I can focus on those because I've been able to use technology to, you know, address this larger group. So I, I think certainly there, there is a middle ground always. <laughs> Opportunities, right? Options. Right. For sure. So, uh, Susan, as we wrap up our conversation today, I would love for you to share with listeners, what is the best way to connect with you if they're interested in learning more about catalytic health partners um, or having a conversation with you? Um, how should they contact you? Well, one of the best ways is our, we have a great website of chpcares.com. Uh, and so they can learn all about what we do and all of our various uh, programs that we have. They can certainly email me at my email address, which is scordts at catalytichealthpartners.com. Um, I have a LinkedIn profile, so under my name, of Susan Kortz, and would love to, to hear from them and engage with them, share with them um, whatever I might know or whatever they may wish to, to chat about. That sounds great. And listeners will have all of that um, information in the show notes below. So you can access that to um, contact Susan directly. So today let's end our conversation. Uh, you, you noted this earlier, so I'm excited to hear what comes to mind. Uh, if you can share um, just one story that makes you feel excited, you know, I, I know that this I'm sure changes over time with what have you heard most recently, but what makes you most excited when you hear about the impact of a patient or are overall proud of the work that you and your team are doing? If you could share that with us. Absolutely. So first I'd say, you know, the world must understand we have an absolutely amazing team of people throughout the state of Arizona doing amazing work. Um, we, you know, we always lead with the heart at Catalytic Health Partners and we have a team with hearts of gold. Um, but I think one, you know, story that I'll share that, you know, I think is, is quite remarkable uh, about the work of our team. And I'll, of course, won't share any names, but relate that we have an individual that we have served uh, in the past, and he um, came to us with many behavioral health as well as physical health issues, having a really difficult time and um, really needing, you know, tons of support. Um, one of those diagnoses being cancer. So if you can only begin to imagine, you put all of that together, unable to speak uh, due to his um, condition. So, you know, make, you know, just making communication hard, right? This individual worked with our team uh, and the community-based providers. Boy, it was a huge collaborative effort. And today is running his own business and has the pieces together to make things happen. So, you know, it is amazing to believe, you know, I, I think the core of that, honestly, Lisa, is to believe in the potential of humans. Human beings have tons of potential, but it all starts with us believing in them. So I care enough about you that I'm willing to listen and engage, and I believe you can do it. Instead of the pessimistic view that some people have of, oh, you'll never be able to do that, or, you know, how do you think you're going to accomplish that? But rather to say, yeah, I hear you. It's what you want to do. I think you can do it. And how can I help? So I really, you know, applaud that individual for all the effort he, his daughter, his family put in trying to make this a reality, overcoming amazing obstacles, and our team for being there every single day, working very hard alongside him to make it real. Oh, that's it's a really wonderful story. Uh, great way to wrap up our conversation today. I certainly got chills as you were uh, talking about that and, and that really remarkable outcome. So thank you so much for sharing that and the, the work of your team and the amazing things they're doing. And thank you for being such an amazing leader and allowing them to do that work. Well, thank you, Lisa. It's 
It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for spending some time with us this afternoon. It's been such a pleasure to learn more about what you guys do day in and day out at Catalytic Health Partners and, and how wonderful that work is. I applaud all of you. And um, I, I thank you for, for sharing with us and our listeners today. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate you having me. Thank you for listening to Happy Hour, Happy Patients. Please consider subscribing on your platform of choice and share your favorite episodes with other healthcare workers who need a bright spot in their day. You can connect with my team and me directly by going to providertech.com and clicking on connect with us. You can find the link to this in the show notes below. Have an awesome week.